The information contained in this presentation and its website, bhacks.net, the service, are for general information purposes only. It is a felony to access or modify a computer system without written permission from that system's owner. To be safe, if you did not purchase the physical device, then you must have written permission beforehand. Everyone talks about the technology of hacking, but few people are talking about the reasoning of the ethics behind it. And you might say to yourself, why do I care about that? It's just that the ethics matter if you don't want to go to jail. So at DEF CON 2018, there were hundreds of talks, but only one small talk related to ethics not that big of a the deal to the, the hacking community if you take it that at face value. So today is Guy Fawkes Day and you might recognize his face everywhere if you have potentially watched V for Vendetta. Guy Fawkes fought poorly against an oppressive government and he's known very well across the UK uh, on today's date. They do a lot of like burning bonfires and things like that. It's just as far as I know, I've never personally experienced it. It's not really covered at all in the US. But for hackers, for some reason, Guy Fox has taken on a whole new life of his own. And uh, let me go ahead and do a close up here. The, the thing about it is he is not actually tied necessarily to the message that we think about today. V for Vendetta, the movie, amplified the message of Guy Fox, But then Anonymous, the hacking collective, took that and amplified it further. They took the message of Guy Fox from V for Vendetta, which was really an adaptation of an adaptation. So at that point, now it's not even really related to the original meaning behind it, except to say fighting against oppressive oppression and an oppressive government. Okay, we can buy that. But just remember that the original meaning behind Guy Fox is kind of almost one of, uh, I hate to say it, the historians talk about it more like he's a bumbling idiot uh, because the entire plot was uncovered very quickly and they were actually being held uh, like puppets the whole time while they were plotting. So the government knew about it and allowed it to go forward until they actually did it so that they could catch them red-handed, make the aristocracy look great in the process. So not a great example for how to fight against oppressive government. But the meaning behind it has some, some value, some weight. Um, and V for Vendetta creates a more um, romanticized version of that that Anonymous kind of seized on. Um, so here's the deal. Hacking is not necessarily a crime. It's a mindset. It becomes an act of defiance against the status quo of authority and establishment. So what does that mean? That means that it allows us to sort of push back against what we think is traditionally the only way to do things or the only way things should be done. It is not done. It is verboten, as the Germans might say. But hacking says, why not? Let's just try it out and see what happens. What's wrong with that? Well, there are a few cases in history that uh, I won't go too in depth with, but just one good example is Edward Snowden. He actually um, was a NSA analyst that discovered that the government was spying on its own citizens and on its own allies like the UK. Um, for purposes of supposedly stopping terrorism, but they could spy on everything, anything and everything you were doing. If you were having a Skype conversation and maybe it had some private stuff going on, they could watch it. If you had a, um, any type of private conversation over email that was going between you and someone else, they could read it. It didn't matter that it wasn't for them. They could get into and see pretty much anything and everything that was going in or out of the country, regardless of who was doing it or why. So, yeah, that's pretty intrusive. Uh, to borrow a, um, a, a, if you will, a, a joke from um, uh, last week tonight with John Oliver, <laughs> for any of you that do watch him, um, 
he did a, a piece on this, if you're interested, it's very, very enlightening. And uh, he said, people don't really care unless maybe it's your dick pics. So what about if it's your dick that gets, gets caught in the dragnet? What about if the NSA starts spying on you and gets dick pics of you? Well, then you might care, right? Well, that's kind of the thing here. It's like you, you have nothing to hide. Well, you've got things that you don't want everyone to know about. So Edward Snowden fought back against that by taking uh, classified material out of the NSA to prove that the NSA was doing this. And he then released that to the to journalists for the purposes of hopefully responsibly disclosing that. Now there's some hiccups there. I won't get into the details, but he did arguably the best job that he could. Um, and then there's also this other category of hacker, which is not just the whistleblowers, but the security researchers. That's where I fall in. And if you're unfamiliar, my name is Brandon Blackburn. I am a secure, certified penetration tester, network penetration tester, and a security researcher. It's what I do, I hack, and I do it for the right reasons. I do it for the good guys. And so this, this is a project near and dear to me. Um, so, but here's the thing, even people who are doing the right thing, like myself, cannot legally find vulnerabilities in this country because a, a business can sue me into oblivion if they don't like what I'm saying. They can order me to uh, basically shut up so that they don't have to fix the problem that I discovered because it's easier to just knock out the person who's doing the, the discovery than it is to fix the discovery. So in this country, we need laws to protect security research. I've discovered vulnerabilities that I personally have to sit on forever because the companies just don't want to fix them. I've discovered vulnerabilities outside of you know, my place of employment because this is just what security researchers do. We do this in our spare time as well as making it part of our full time. And I can never do anything about it because those companies simply don't want to do anything about it. So there it is. Hopefully no one ever gets bit by those vulnerabilities. The likelihood is someone probably will. So what should you do about this? Why should you, you know, do, how, how can you make this better? And it's simple. In your country, vote for candidates who actually support security research legislation. People who get it, who understand the necessity to the modern internet of having security research in full view of the public and making it a first class citizen of security, re security as a whole for the nation and as well as for businesses in that nation. Um, because right now, politicians just don't get it. They see it as breaking the law and they've made laws which ba back that up. And very few countries have any sort of protections for people trying to do the right thing. There it is. All right, so with that out of the way, let's jump into actually getting started hacking. Now, if we go over to the desktop, you'll see that I've already uh, finished installation of VMware Workstation Player. Um, so the other thing here is, there's gonna be a lot of different people that will want to just simply throw in uh, links into the description of the videos. With this, I'd like to show you guys how to find this stuff so that it's still relevant to you years down the road. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna download three utilities. We're gonna download VMware Player, we're gonna download 7-Zip, and we're gonna download Kali Linux. So the first is the largest, which is Kali Linux. You're gonna first go to Google or your search engine of choice and search K-A-L-I-L-I-N-U-X Linux. You're going to find the first entry here, Kali.org, home of Kali Linux, advanced penetration testing distribution. Fine. Let's click it. And then we're going to go to downloads, download Kali Linux. All right. We're going to scroll down to the bottom and we're going to go to Kali Linux 64-bit VMware. Now, if you happen to be on a Mac and you can't get a hold of virtualization software that takes uh, OVF files or OVA files, if you don't know what those are and you're not sure, uh, and you happen to be vir using VirtualBox, just simply grab the VirtualBox version. You don't necessarily have to use VirtualBox. And on Windows, I would say just don't use it. I mean, there's plenty of people that will say, heresy, why would you say that? 
I've used VMware almost my entire professional life. I love it. I know that it's really reliable and solid software. So let's just use what I know how to use, what I know best how to use actually. And from here, we're gonna go to the correct 64-bit version, either VirtualBox or VMware, and scroll down and grab Kali Linux VMware 64-bit. And you're just gonna download that. It's gonna take a while. Next, we're gonna download 7-zip, and you're gonna find that by just searching 7-zip. For people on Macs and Linux, they have built-in 7-zip support, as far as I know, 7z is the extension. Um, if not, then follow you know, whatever Google guide that you need uh, for getting that set up on your particular distribution. So 7-zip, we're gonna download not the alpha version, we wanna download the regular version, which is up at the top. We're gonna download the 64-bit executable, download that, great. All right, that won't take very long. The next step is to download VMware Player. So VMware changes the name of this, but just simply search VMware Player because they've changed the name of it over the years quite a bit. We're just gonna search VMware Workstation Player and uh, VMware Workstation Player, blah, blah, blah. That's where we wanna go. All right, now if you're unsure where to click and it doesn't specifically give you a download link, it's probably because they got you again and they're trying to keep people from using the player version, which is the free version. It's really dumb. So if that's the case and you happen to find that VMware has done that yet again, then we're gonna go to the downloads, wherever that happens to be. In this case, it's at the top. Free product downloads, workstation player. Okay, so from here, now we've got Try VMware Workstation Player for Windows. Don't worry about Try, because if this is just for personal use, then it's totally fine to use it. It's totally free to use it too. So download that now. All right, so I've already done that and downloaded it and installed it. So let me make sure that license. Um, so here's the thing. If you're doing this under a free license, then you don't really need to put a license in. So you can just hit skip and hit finish. All right, now I've got VMware Workstation Player. So you guys are probably still downloading. If you need to, you can, if you're watching this after the fact, you can just pause right here and wait for your downloads to finish easy enough. But uh, now let's go to VMware Workstation Player. And on Windows, you can just type VMware Workstation. And here we go. Wait for that to load. Use for free, non-commercial use. Yes. All right. Now we can open a virtual machine. Oh, Workstation Pro. Uh, skip. If you see anything that says Pro, skip it. Don't do it. So now, if you haven't already, you're gonna to need to download and install 7-zip. Okay, Kali Linux is extracted. Now, you'll wanna take this and put this file somewhere where you won't delete it on accident. So for me, I personally prefer putting it into my home directory. And we're gonna go back over real quick the steps that we took so far while we wait. Steps was, we got uh, Kali Linux. Kali Linux. Kali.org. Next, we got 7-zip. And where is that available at? 7-zip. 7-zip.org, okay. 7-zip.org. Org. Next, we got preferably VMware. Player. And we get that at, uh, let's see, VMware, VMware.com. So that's where we got, that's where we get them from. 
or just search for them on Google. All right, back to the main event. After jumping through all those hoops, we now have Kali Linux ready. At this point, you have information gathering, vulnerability analysis, all the happy stuff that we've got in here. Um, if you're gonna be doing any of the password hacks, then you want to generally have it installed on a system with a powerful graphics card, GPU, um, because a lot of these need the um, GPU to accelerate them, um, kind of like Hashcat and a few of the others. Um, and there's actually more utilities on here than you actually see. So you may see some people referring to utilities in Kali um, and say like, where's, you know, Hashcat HCL? Like, well, Hashcat is actually on the command line. So let me do Hashcat. Yeah, see there's Hashcat. So it's got Hashcat already. Um, it's just not visible in right in here. So a lot of these are gonna be the graphical utilities. Some interesting things that you might try with your own equipment are things like Fern Wi-Fi Cracker. Aircrack NG is fantastic, but uh, it is a little more advanced. It is very powerful, very, very powerful. Great, great software. Um, but if you just wanna, you know, kind of play around, you can do Fern Wi-Fi Cracker or Wi-Fi. Fern Wi-Fi Cracker is pretty easy to use. And the other thing is, you probably don't wanna have Kali running all the time. You pretty much just wanna have it running while you're actively using it. Um, professional version is now available. Would you like to? No, I would not. Um, so what you would do is you would plug in a USB Wi-Fi adapter. Um, if you don't have one, just make sure that you purchase one that has injection support built in. It has to have the ability to do injection and uh, promiscuity as well. So it has to have promiscuous mode and injection capability. Um, just do a search for it and just see if it has that built in. And uh, a lot of them, if you search on Amazon, the people will mention in the, in the uh, driver support, they'll be like, oh yeah, this supports it. Or what, I don't know what that means. Or it won't mention anything, in which case just don't get the ones that don't have that mentioned in the comments. Um, so in theory, you would get one that had it, uh, had injection and promiscuity built in. You'd hit refresh, you'd see that, you could hit scan for access points. And at that point, you'd be able to determine your target that you want to attack. And depending on the type of encryption that it uses, um, WEP would be super easy to break into and it happens pretty fast. The only requirement is that people have to be associated to that hotspot. If they're not associated with the hotspot, then WEP can take a very long time in order to actually break into. So you generally want the WEP attack to occur when you know people are there. The WPA attack is a little bit easier to kick off in that um, you don't necessarily have to have um, a ton of people. Like WEP, the, the more people that are on the hotspot, the faster you can break into it. Whereas with WPA, yes, it's still the case that you can break in faster with more people, but it's a little bit more quiet because you're able to um, just pick on one particular person associating with it and kick them off so that you can inject yourself into it. Um, that one's gonna take a graphics card usually to accelerate or a very press fast processor. I'm not sure if Fern uses the GPU to accelerate, but uh, I know you can get Aircrack to use the GPU if you've got the right module installed. I don't know if the base version of Kali has that bake baked in. Uh, and then the key database is for where you would actually store keys that you've discovered. Um, Toolbox has some, you know, some nice, eh, relatively nice tools. Um, but the main things are the scan and then you detect and, and attack the target. Um, so that one's pretty fun. Um, then there is a few of these other like web application uh, Burp Suite is kind of like the end-all be-all of web security testing. Um, the Community Edition is missing some nice features that the Pro version has. Um, your JRE appears to be version blah 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 has not been fully tested. Okay, don't share this again. 
Come on. Burp is a huge program. So naturally it's gonna take a while for it to load. That is if it decides to load, okay. T's and C's. No, I accept. All right. An update is available. We'll just close that for now. We're gonna do a temporary project. Use burp defaults, start burp. All right. So this is burp. It's got the ability to uh, in sort of interpose itself in between a uh, target and the internet so that you're able to reflect data through yourself or force people to connect to you as if you are a uh, web server. There's also the ability to, um, if you're on the same network se segment, you can actually watch connections and, and things of that nature. Um, there's a lot of capabilities here. I'm not gonna get into all of them. Just do some Google searches. You'll find um, plenty of, plenty of uh, burp guides. I'm just kind of showing you guys the main utilities that we tend to use. And you can, um, at that point, find out whatever you're interested in. Um, so one of the nice utilities is the exploit database. And the exploit DB is gonna be a web interface. And what it does is it allows you to search for vulnerabilities. Now you can access this from a web, regular web browser without being in Kali, which could be to your advantage because uh, sometimes it's a little bit annoying using the VMs. Um, but you can go to HTTPS, Whack, whack, www, exploit-db.com. And this is a nice database of all of the different vulnerabilities that people have publicly published. Um, so for instance, this is a denial of service attack against Amarok. If you happen to be using uh, a Linux system that has Amarok installed, then this, this particular exploit could be useful against that particular version. Um, it says, you know, whether it's been uh, verified, the CVE associated with it. And usually they'll have like a, um, an actual proof of concept code just to get you started. And sometimes you can actually use that code um, directly against the vulnerabilities. Or at a minimum, it'll give you a place to start. So maybe you've got a particular version of, let's say Windows, whoa. Let's go Windows, 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 Windows. And let's do port um, 443. So it's gonna be Exchange. So if you've got a Windows platform that has port 443 uh, uh, open and exploitable, and you happen to know that there may be running Exchange on it or SharePoint server, then you can just follow that. Potentially you wanna see which version is, is vulnerable um, because some of these will be so old that they're no longer really relevant. Um, but these at least give you a starting point. These are kind of just the big, big grab bag of all the vulnerabilities that are publicly available. Um, most of them will be fixed, so don't expect if you're attacking a target that is fully updated with the latest everything of software, don't expect it to be super easy to uh, break into because oftentimes it's the ones that don't update that are the easiest, um, which is good, a good food for thought for you. If you are testing yourself with maybe a vulnerability, you probably want to try installing the base version of the OS that you're attacking and not updating it just leaving it at the base version and, and not running any auto updates or anything like that. Um, maybe even disconnect it from the internet so it doesn't auto update. Um, and then you can attack it to your heart's content as a virtual machine um, on your virtual network inside your computer. That's a, a way that I typically frame up uh, my attacks so that you can verify that they work and it's just kind of a, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an exploitable box. Um, so some of the other utilities. We've got, let's see, reverse engineering. The, oh, they don't have it. I was hoping they had it. Well, they've got NASM. So if you happen to want to do, um, if you want to do reverse engineering, there's that. 
that might be a whole nother episode unto its, oh, it's definitely a, another one. The biggest and most well-known is Metasploit Framework. So Metasploit is a, is a attack platform within, um, within Kali Linux. Um, pseudo password, yeah, okay. So when you kick off Kali, or when you kick off uh, Metasploit, you start up the database. It's got a Postgres backend that it runs as a, um, as a system to keep track of all the variables that it, it runs. Um, it kicks off the console, and you've got the MSF console. Now, MSF has basically everything hacking in the hacking world in some way usually touches MSF. Um, if you want to get familiar with MSF, there's a number of guides out there. It is, it is the utility that we, we use so often. And um, I'm just trying to give you guys an overview, so I'm not going to get into it. But you'll be able to, with any kind of guides, figure out any number of vulnerabilities and ways to attack them uh, using Metasploit. So Metasploit is, is the, the one to remember. Um, let's see, some others, let's see, let's see, let's see. OS backdoors, where are they put in there? Exploitation tools, no, they haven't. Oh, Searchploit allows you to search the exploit DB from inside the console of your Kali Linux installation, so it can be a lot faster than that, than uh, going to the website. Social Engineering Toolkit, or SET, is a really handy utility for social engineering targets, obviously. Um, yes, I agree to the terms. It's got a number of utilities within it that allow you to quickly um, create attacks, attack campaigns. Um, so I just typed in one. Now it's got spear phishing attack vectors, website attack. Let's say um, mass, uh, mass mailer attack. Social Engineering Toolkit as a mass emailer. There are two options that set up as a mass emailer. This would, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, single address or email attack vector. Basically, it steps you through the process of setting up any of these attacks and um, allows you to um, very fat, very quickly build out any kind of uh, attack vector that you, you like. Or attack campaign would be a better way to put it. So that's SET or SET. It is fantastic. Um, let's see, some other ones. Proxy Chains is phenomenal utility. Allows you to basically bounce things between systems and uh, creates ways for you to exploit systems and other networks that you don't actually have access to directly. If you're able to get a system uh, compromised, you can use prox Proxy Chains to bounce your connection through into the network inside of it. So that's what proxy chains will do for you. Um, there's also some nice utilities in here, which like Binwalk, uh, Hashdeep, these allow you to take apart binaries and review them so that you're able to um, determine the nature of how they, they work. So there's not all negatives in here. There's all, there are well, negatives. There's not all, um, just shady utilities in here. There's also forensic utilities, which directly assist with finding data on a, on a, like a hard drive or um, pulling apart a system after it's been compromised, things like that. Um, yeah, there's MSF Payload Creator, Multigo, fantastic utility, allows you to create models and all sorts of um, campaigns, attacks, uh, it does, so many things that it's really difficult for me to put into words all the things that you can do with it. Um, it's just a very, very powerful utility for um, any sort of attack campaign. It'll keep track of the entire process for you. It'll allow you to keep track of findings. It'll keep track of um, notes, things like that. Um, let's do Multigo CE. If you're doing this for a business, I would highly recommend that they purchased the Multigo Pro license because it is 
Uh, it definitely has more features that are, that are pretty dang nice. Please complete the CAPTCHA. What CAPTCHA? Please complete the CAPTCHA. There's a CAPTCHA? Oh. Oh, it's wanting me to create that. I forgot that <laughs> it's like some of these is just like, oh, crap, that's right. They make you do that. I won't fight with that right now. Yeah, so when I exit Multigo. Anyway, you would go through, set up your Multigo account and run through the creation of that. It allows you to scan uh, spider w uh, websites, find any information that might be useful or handy, things of that nature. Um, sniffing and spoofing. Man in the middle proxies, fantastic. Matt, uh, Edercap is another great utility for um, basically sniffing the network that you're on and you can actually use it in conjunction with a few other utilities to sniff off of the network and see what other people are are looking at um, there's a there's a chain that you can create where you have um, it, this one doesn't get used by me very often because it's uh, really challenging to make use of anymore because everybody's got SSL connections, but when people had regular um, HTTP connections, you could actually see all the images and stuff that they were loading and, and open them up through uh, using Edercap and a few other utilities. Um, let's see, reporting tools, those could be potentially useful for you uh, in terms of keeping up with findings and a pen test. And uh, yeah, so We'll go into some of these utilities at a later date. We'll maybe go through getting some of them set up and created, maybe some MSF stuff. Um, but I really just wanted to show you guys what all was possible and create a, uh, a nice little playground for us to get started. So um, yeah, I didn't want to belabor it too much. That is Kali Linux and how you get started. And um, yeah. Like I said, uh, that should be pretty much all you need to get started. And um, I think that'll about be it for today. Let's, uh, let's see you guys back here next week. And uh, check out the YouTube channel for highlights. And I'll be posting new content on there as well. So don't forget to, um, let's see, where is it? Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube for that information so you can be aware whenever I do post stuff there. And also on Facebook, don't forget to click that follow button. And while you're at it, why not like it as well? And uh, yeah, that's all we've got for today. Thank you very much for tuning in and I will see you guys next week.